أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على خير الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا الأولين والآخرين شفيء المذنبين رحمة للعالمين وحبيب إله العالمين ولا حبيب إلا هو وأهله الذي ثم في السماء بأحمد وفي العربي بأب القاسم محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المذلومين قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق ولاستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أوهي إلي أنه استمع نفر من الجن فقالوا إنا سمعنا قرآنا عجبا يهدي إلى الرشد فآمنا به ولن نشرك بربنا أهدا وأنه تعالى جد ربنا ما اتخذ صاحبة ولا ولدا وأنه كان يقول سفيهنا على الله شططا وأنا ظننا أن لن تقول الإنس والجن على الله كذبا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله عليه محمد وآله After completing chapter 71 of the whole Qur'an, Surah Nuh, as we have been discussing for the last several nights, we enter into chapter 72 of the whole Qur'an in what is known as Surah Al-Jinn. Oftentimes when people, they reference this particular term, jinn, they take a lot of interest in regards to the nature of this creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It seems very ambiguous, something very hidden, something very metaphorical sometimes in terms of our perception of who exactly are the jinns that has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. We see that upwards of 20 times within the whole Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the term jinn. And he mentions specific interactions of specific prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who have dealt with these jinn. We see for instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the story of Adam and Iblis in the heaven. Of course, Iblis, shaitan, is from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, known as the jinn. Similarly, we go, for instance, to the story of Prophet Sulaiman. And we see that Nabi Sulaiman, when he was the leader of that empire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had gifted toward him, we see that Nabi Sulaiman, he had control over all of God's creation. And amongst those creation were the jinn. In fact, we see that the jinn during the time of Prophet Sulaiman والسلام, they were in charge of architecture and building up the institutions of that nation, of that community of Prophet Sulaiman Furthermore, then we come forth and we see the example of the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his interaction with the jinn in this particular chapter, chapter 72 of the whole Qur'an. And we see that on several occasions perhaps, the Holy Prophet ﷺ has a physical encounter with this creation, which is again apparently very unique. The first question that we need to pose in regards to this creation is, do jinn really exist? Absolutely, there's no doubt that anyone can deny the existence of this creation of God. But many people, they want to understand what is the true nature of this creation. Who are they? What are they? Can we see them? Can we visit them? Can we talk to them? Can they enter into our bodies? Can we enter into them? All of these type of discussions are not really, really relevant when we're coming to or discussing this particular subject. Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a large number of different types of creation that he's never even mentioned within the whole Qur'an or are not present within the hadith, that, that are not present within the hadith literature. Why? Because they're not relevant to us in terms of our relationship building with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For instance, it is stated within a narration of Ahlul Bayt salam, that God has created specific angels. These angels, they are so involved in their obedience 
and in terms of their worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they do not even know that anyone else has been created. They're so busy worshipping, they're so busy in prayer, they're so busy in supplication, they're so busy in munajat, that they have no other concept that there's a creation other than themselves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So similarly, like we mentioned, that there could be numerous different types of creations of God living on Jupiter, living on Saturn, living on the moon, in different dimensions, and different cosmos that we have absolutely no concept of because they're not very relevant to us. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala several times within the whole of the Quran mentions the creation of the jinn, like we mentioned upwards of 20 times within the whole of the Quran, it is ber- it is because of those particular examples, they are relevant for us to understand the creation of God. For instance, one of those verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ We did not create man, nor did we create jinn, except for the purpose of worship. From this we extract several different lessons. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates jinn for the same purpose that He's created human being. And that is to attain closeness toward God because God wanted slaves and servants to obey Him and to worship. Secondly, from this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates a creation to worship Him only when that creation has the potential to understand that God is the Creator. Meaning that at some length, I don't know how limited or how expansive, but jinn, like human beings, have been created with the intellect. They have the ability to know, they have the ability to perceive, they have the ability to understand, and they have the ability to act upon whatever it is that they have knowledge. Narrations of Ahlul Bayt come forth and they tell us that jinns can be good jinns, they can be bad jinn, like the human being. We are good human being and we are bad human beings. Furthermore, we come forth and we see the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt they state that jinns can be disbelievers and they can be believers. And it is stated according to our narrations that jinns, they do not have their own prophets or their own hierarchy of divine authority, but it is the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning the 124,000, which are the prophets of all of creation. Meaning that a jinn has the ability to submit toward Adam and toward Nuh and toward Ibrahim and toward Musa and toward Isa and toward our holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala, or to not believe in them or, and to not be receptive to them. Meaning that there are Christian jinns, there are Jewish jinns, there are Muslim jinns. We recite in the ziyara, the ziyara of Imam al-Zaman, which we are always reciting every single day after prayers, As-salamu alayka ya imamuna, imam al-insi, wal-jinn. Peace be upon you, O our imam, the imam of humanity and the imam of jinn. Meaning that even the Imams of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, they have authority over that dimension of creation, the dimension of creation of jinn. That they are the Imams of all of the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it doesn't necessarily segregate this specific creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we want to go ahead and take a look at chapter 72 of the whole Quran, we have to see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge these jinn in the same way that He judges us. That they are, yes, they're created of a different nature. We necessarily cannot see them. And all of this type of discussion that enters, inshallah, we'll get into it in another night. But though we cannot necessarily see them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this potential for individuals to interact with them only if they're regulated to being amongst the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the divinely appointed authorities of God by means of the imams of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salatu wa and as we go ahead and begin to reflect upon this particular chapter over the next uh, upcoming nights, inshallah, we'll be, get, we, we, we'll be able to understand a little bit more in terms of depth of who exactly are this creation, what is their nature, and what was their relationship with the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So let us go ahead and take a look immediately at chapter 72 of the whole Quran after, Prophet, uh, after the story of Prophet Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Surat Al-Jinn A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring, begins every single chapter in the name of Allah the most compassionate the most merciful Qul 
أُوْحِيَا إِلَيَّا أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَأَ نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنْ فَقَالُوا أَنَّا فَقَالُوا إِنَّا سَمَأْنَا قُرْآنًا أَجَبًا Let's take a look at this phrase by phrase. قُلْ أُوْحِيَا إِلَيَّ أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَأَ نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنْ Say, O Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a direct commandment to the Holy Prophet when he states قُلْ And this is common whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins any verse or begins any chapter with قُلْ He's speaking directly toward the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But just because God is speaking directly to the Prophet doesn't mean that we can't take any lesson from it. We take a lesson in terms of the context and in terms of the receptivity of the Holy Prophet when receiving such a commandment. قُلْ أُوْحِيَا إِلَيَّ أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَعَ نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجَنْ Say, O Prophet, that you have been receiving a revelation, meaning God has told you that there was a group of jinn who were listening toward your words. What is the story behind this? Or what is the context of this revelation? It is stated that the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he would spend a large portion of the night performing the tahajjud salat. He would be performing salatul layl namaz al-shab. He would spend it for the last third of his night and then leading up to salatul fajr. And in the midst of his Salatul Layl, he would recite a lot of Qur'an. Let me give you an example. Today, for instance, whenever we perform any mustahab prayer, any mustahab prayer, we know that the only thing that is wajib in terms of mustahab prayer is the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, until the end of the surah. If you don't want to recite the second surah, you don't have to do that. You can just go after reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, enter into ruku, sujood, and so on and so forth. But you have to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. For instance, we have in other mustahab prayers, there's a recommendation to recite, you know, several surahs. For instance, in the Salatul Witr of Salatul Layl, we are told to recite Surah Al-Fatiha, three times, Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, Surah Al-Falaq, Surah Al-Nas. At the very least, we should try to do this. But if you can't do that, you're running out of time, it's about to become the time of Salatul Fajr, just recite Surah Al-Fatiha and go into the Qunut and then go on with your prayers. Yes? When it comes toward the Holy Prophet Sallallahu he begins to recite Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Imran, chapters that we probably would never even think about reciting in our Mustahab Salah. He would recite a lot of Qur'an in the midst of his prayers. So the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam is performing Salatul Layl, he's performing Salatul Fajr. When it is said that a group of jinn, they were passing by. In their dimension, they have the ability to see us, but we don't necessarily have the potential to see them. So they're passing by and they begin to hear the verses of the Holy Prophet ﷺ coming out from this time. Many people, they misunderstand this particular point. They think that the jinn, they were so infatuated by the recitation, by the speech, by the style of recitation of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, which is why it made them stop and listen. But it wasn't only that. Of course, the Holy Prophet, I'm sure he had the most beautiful voice ever, Right? That we cannot even imagine. But the reason for the jinn stopping was not because of the beautiful voice of the Holy Prophet, but it was because of the words that the Holy Prophet was reciting. So we go back toward this verse of the whole Quran. And let's go ahead and reflect. That there were a group of jinn who were listening, performing istima of the Holy Prophet's words, of the Holy Prophet's recitation of the whole Quran. In the Arabic language, we have the term sama'a, which means to listen, and istima', which means to listen attentively. Sama'a probably means to hear, right? Sama'allahu liman hamida. When we get up from the ruku and we state sama'allahu liman hamida, it literally means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears the one who praises him, which is why we state alhamdulillah, right? Because every single time we praise Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he hears that praise. And it goes toward him, and it allows you to build a link with your Lord and your Creator. So we hear the word that is used is astama'ah. Astama'ah. That they weren't only hearing the recitation of the whole Qur'an, but they were listening attentively. Meaning that they were listening not only with their ears, but they were also listening with their heart. When we're driving on the road, right? We're coming to the mosque during the holy month of Ramadan, and we have the Qur'an playing, you know, in our cars. We can be listening to the whole Qur'an or we could be focusing on the whole Qur'an. We could be hearing the verses or we could be listening attentively. There's a stark difference. If you go to a restaurant and you're eating dinner and there's music playing in the background, the fuqaha state that if you go there and you're listening to music, it's okay. Uh, if, sorry, if, if you go there and you hear the music, it's fine. 
But if you go there and you're listening to the music, then this is where it becomes a problem. This is a difference between sema'ah and estama'ah. Over here it states that these group of jinn who were passing by the Holy Prophet they were listening attentively to the words of the Holy Prophet So as these jinn were passing by, we mentioned that these jinn are passing by in a group. According to some of the Muslims of the Holy Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the term nafar, it means a group between three and ten people. Allahu Alam, in regards to what exactly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was alluding to, but what do we learn from this? Like human beings, jinn may also walk around in groups. Naturally, we as a human being, we don't necessarily want to walk in the middle of the night alone. We like to go out with people, we like to go out with our friends, we like to meet up with people, we like to discuss and so on and so forth. The jinns are exactly the same way. They have a lot of similarities with the human being and that is what perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to demonstrate toward us that in the same way that you are affected by the people who you, who, who you, are, who you are surrounded with, that's the same way that the jinn are also are influenced by the people or that by the creation, by the jinn that they hang around with themselves. After they heard the Holy Prophet Sallallahu recitation of the Holy Quran in the midst of prayers, they dispersed. They dispersed together as a group and they began to tell each other amongst themselves, Inna sama'na Qur'anan ajaba. That surely we have heard something wondrous. We have surely heard something unbelievable. When we go ahead and take a look at the dichotomy or comparing this group of jinn who heard the revelation of the Holy Prophet and the people of Nuh what do we see? Did this group of jinn, they hear the entirety of the Holy Quran? No, they heard a couple of verses being uttered from the Holy Prophet While Nuh preaches the message for 950 years, but they were completely, irrespectively, unresponsive toward the teachings of the Prophet of God. What's the difference? We mention that in order for someone to be receptive toward the divine commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their hearts need to be prepared for it. Their hearts need to be softened in order to be receptive toward the teachings of God, toward the legislation of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala, toward the narrations of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wa salam. This group of jinn, though as we will see in the next couple of verses, they were idol worshippers. They were polytheists themselves. You see that their hearts were inclined toward goodness. Not everyone who does a bad deed, not everyone who's an open sinner should be judged and condemned to hell right away. How we can't do that? Even these jinn who are idol worshippers, upon hearing a little bit, a segment of the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, immediately they changed. Similarly, the human being. Don't judge and classify every single group of people as everyone who does not come to the mosque are going to go to hell. No, no, you can't do that. You have to give everyone the opportunity because they might have a potential to change in their life. They might have a potential to be receptive to the religion of Islam, to the teachings of the Holy Quran, to the teachings of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and the Ahlul Bayt Wasallam in another day. But you have to give them the opportunity. You have to present toward them the hujjah. قَالُوا إِنَّا سَمَئْنَا قُرْآنًا أَجَبَا so these jinn quickly, they gathered together amongst themselves and they began to discuss what they just heard and they began to tell one another that surely we have just heard something extremely unique. It was absolutely beautiful. It was stunning what we have just heard from the Holy Prophet They continue conversing amongst themselves. In verse number two, يَهْدِي إِلَى الرُّشْتِ فَآمَنَّا بِهِ وَلَنْ نُشْرِكْ بِرَبِّنَا أَهَدَا Surely from those words of the Holy Qur'an, we were led toward perfection. We were taken toward guidance. We were guided toward that which God wanted us to attain. The Holy Qur'an, the verses of this book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, they have that potential, but we have to make sure that when we recite the Holy Qur'an, that we are trying to be guided by the Holy Verses and not trying to do the guiding of the Holy Verses. What's the difference? You come forth and you see 
that today we have two different groups of Muslims. Generally, you have mainstream Muslims, those who believe in the Holy Prophet those who believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not separate the whole Qur'an from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then we have another group of people who have completely distanced themselves from this particular notion. And they state that God has revealed us the Qur'an and we are to be the interpreters of the Qur'an and our reading of the Qur'an is the right, correct reading of the whole Qur'an. And we see what is taking place on the other side of the world today. And even on this side of the world. When you try to guide the Qur'an, you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closes off your heart and states that if you think that you're the interpreter of the Qur'an, you don't understand anything. But on the flip side, you come forth and you see people who allow their hearts and their minds and their souls to be open toward the revelation of the book, and you allow the Qur'an to speak to you. By this, you come and you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide you and take you toward that guidance, will take you toward that perfection. This group of jinn, they were just walking by. But when they heard those revelation, that when they began to hear the verses recited from the tongue of the beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what do we see? We see that their hearts began to become open toward that which they were hearing. They began to contemplate upon the verses that the Holy Prophet began to recite and they stated immediately that we know that these verses are going to take us toward success and they're going to take us toward virtue. Yahdi ila rushd. Surely it will take us toward perfection. Fa'amanna bih. So we believed. When someone comes to you and presents toward you logical deductions and you still state, I don't believe, you're never going to believe. But when someone comes forth and presents toward you the truth and it's very apparent that truth, you have to submit toward it. You can't go any other way. The minute that these jinn, this group of jinn, they began to hear the words of the whole Qur'an, immediately they stated, we have to submit. So we believed in it. And surely we will not attribute partners to God anymore. Meaning what again? That they were idol worshippers. They were polytheists themselves, but the minute that they heard the revelation of the whole Qur'an, they submitted toward it and they threw away all of their previous beliefs just so they can focus on what they heard from the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam. Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam. Verse number 3, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues in chapter 72 of the whole Qur'an, وَأَنَّهُ تَعَالَى جَدُّ رَبِّنَا مَتَّخَذَا صَاحِبَةً وَلَا وَلَدَا And surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far exalted, far exalted from having a spouse and from having children. Some of the mufassirin of the whole Qur'an, they come forth and they state that because there was a group of jinn, during that time when these jinn, they, they were living, that they were attributing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to having a spouse or to having a father and to having a child or having a son. Another group of the Mufassirin, they come forth and they state, no, that rather this, when, when the jinn mentioned that God is exalted of having any sort of family relations, he is, they, they are speaking what they were hearing from the Christian community of the time when they state that God has a father and a son and so on and so forth. Either way, we come and we see that they began to reflect amongst themselves and began to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His essential nature is beyond all of this. There is nothing like Him. We cannot state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a physical form, nor can we state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so far away that there's no point in even trying to gain the knowledge or ma'rafa of Him like other people state, or they're not completely absent to the fact that there's no point in terms of even reflecting on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They begin to realize that God is exalted, and thus it becomes our responsibility then to be His worshippers, to obey His command, and so on. And so forth. رَبَّنَا مَتَّخَذَا صَاحِبَةً وَلَا وَلَدَا وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ يَقُولُ سَفِيهُنَا عَلَى اللَّهِ شَطَطَا And surely there were a couple of fools from amongst us. They're stating, they're, again, they're stating amongst themselves. Surely there were a couple of fools from amongst us who would state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who would exaggerate the position of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on one spectrum or the other. What are some lessons that we can attain from this? Number one, that there's always a group of people who think that they know about God and they always give false accusations toward Him. For instance, there is one group of Muslim theologians, they come and they state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sits on a throne and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has feet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wears clothes and that we will be able to see Him on the Day of Judgment. 
We in the school of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, state that this is limiting God toward place, this is limiting God toward time, and so on and so forth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like we mentioned in this verse, Laysa kamatrihi shay. There is nothing like him. Thus you cannot compare him to the human being in any sort of variation. Then on the flip side, we come and we see that there's another group of people who come and they attribute partners to God. They state that God is two or God is three. Right? And of course, this is completely rejected as well. But the interesting thing that the conversation that these jinn are uh, engaging in during this particular time, in verse number 4 of the Holy Quran of chapter 72, That there is some foolish people from amongst us who are bringing forth these claims about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like the human being, jinn also have fools walking around pretending like they know everything. So they also encounter the same issues and the same problems. We come forth and when we reflect upon this verse of the Holy Quran, again, we need to make sure that we are in gatherings, that we engage in conversation that is going to allow our, proge- our, our progression and not allow for individuals or for, in their context, for jinn to change the course of the discussion and bring forth, and, and bring forth false ideologies and false accus- accusations about the religion of Islam. Someone will come in a gathering and they'll state, you know what? The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he's just a normal man. Why do we speak about the Holy Prophet so much? The minute that this type of conversation enters into a community, we see that the fabric of that community begins to go on the decline. Another individual state that we speak about Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali alayhi salatu wasalam too much. Where did this ma'atam come from? Where did this poetry come from? All of these doubts that are brought, in, brought forth to our community, they have the potential to break the fabric of the society. They have the potential to break the fabric of the community because they're bringing doubts into children who haven't necessarily heard the majadis all of these years and are not convicted in terms of their belief system in the first place. This we need to bring forth discussions that bring forth conviction in our hearts and in our minds as opposed to allowing fools in the, in the words of the whole Quran to enter into our gatherings and change our ideologies. This is on one level. On a second level, we need to make sure that we're constantly asking questions, that we're constantly doing our best to increase in knowledge, to make sure that we're not taking information from everyone. When someone comes and brings forth a piece of knowledge stating that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the whole Quran, even myself, come and ask me if you don't understand so that you're able to increase your knowledge, so that we're able as a community to increase our knowledge, so that, so, that we're not allow, so that we're not allowing and facilitating for false information to be fed into our minds and into our hearts. Going back to where the verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ يَقُولُ سَفِيحُنَا عَلَى اللَّهِ شَطَطَ They're saying amongst themselves, because they're a group of fools in our community who are coming and presenting this false ideology about God. وَأَنَّا بَنَنَّا أَن لَن تَقُولَ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنِ عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا And they begin to state, And surely we thought that jinn and humanity, they never lie. Oftentimes when we're young, when we're perhaps naive, we think that everyone who comes and gives you information about religion, they're sincere. They want to do it because they want to tell you how to get closer toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you right in this verse that the jinn have that same problem. They believe that everyone who came and told them about worshipping this idol and worshipping that idol, that every one of their ideology was correct. We never thought that people would lie to us about religion. We have to understand that's absolutely a you know, ludicrous thought that perhaps enters into our mind and into our community. وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ يَقُولُ سَفِيهُنَا عَلَى اللَّهِ شَطَطَى وَأَنَّا بَنَنَّا أَن لَن تَقُولَ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنْ we would have never expected that any sort of lies would have been labeled on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me conclude with this particular point, and then inshallah we'll continue the next several set of verses tomorrow night, inshallah. We come forth and we see that when these verses that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was reciting in the midst of that prayer, as he mentioned the jinn, they immediately submit toward the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa They went in after the Holy Prophet, according to narrations, got a gathering with this group of jinn. Immediately after they saw the Holy Prophet, because they've heard the message already, they submitted right away. While Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even our Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would present the ayat of revelation, would present the words of the Holy Quran on several different occasions. People were just that receptive toward that. Abu Sufyan, for instance. Abu Sufyan is from the Quraysh. 
he knows the Holy Prophet ﷺ from childhood. He knows him from childhood. And he lives after the Holy Prophet ﷺ as well. He lives, you know, through the times of some of the Khulafa. Abu Sufyan, not for one moment, was ever receptive toward the teachings of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. His heart had not been trained. His heart had not been cultivated. It was so hard in sin and in vice and in immorality that even though he lived with the Holy Prophet ﷺ, even though he heard the verses of the Holy Prophet coming directly from his tongue, even though he saw the beautiful face of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he was never receptive toward that. On the flip side, we see a man like Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari. Who is Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari? Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari is not even from Mecca. He's not from Mecca, but he begins to hear the teachings of the Holy Prophet. He begins to hear, you know, news spreads very quickly, naturally, especially in the East, in our communities, in our cultures, right? One news happens in one household, the whole world hears about it, right? And that was before the time of internet, and that was before phones, and that was before social networking. But the news began to spread slowly within the Arabian Peninsula, that there's a man by the name of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma sallam. Who is saying, who is coming forth and stating that he is a prophet of God. So it is said that Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari, he leaves his city and he enters into the holy city of Mecca. He goes toward the Kaaba and he's performing some acts of prayer, or meditation, whatever, whatever it was. And Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu was also in Masjid al-Haram, next to the holy Kaaba. It is said that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, from a distance he sees that this man is a stranger, not knowing who is Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari. So he goes toward Abu Dhar and he says, oh man, can I help you? Are you new over here? He says, yes, I am. He says, why don't you come at my place and stay? Stay over. You're new over here? C- come over my place. I'll feed you. You have a place to you know, uh, rest and so on and so forth. Come to my house. And it said, Abu Dhar says, I have no other place to go. Otherwise, I'm going to spend my time over here. So no problem. I will come and join you. What did Abu Dhar come for? He came to see the Holy Prophet. But he couldn't necessarily go straight toward Amir al-Mu'mineen and say that I'm here to see Muhammad. Why? Because during that time there's a lot of political pressure and not everyone is openly stating that they're Muslims and so on. So it is stated that after three days or so, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, he goes toward Abu Dhar. He says, look brother, he says, you've been in my house for three days. You want to tell me why you're here? What's the whole deal? I gave you a place to stay. I gave you a place to eat. Why did you come? Abu Dhar, he hesitates for a minute. He says, who is this man? I have no idea. This man Ali, who has been hospitable toward me, he could be one of those who is putting pressure on the Holy Prophet and I can't necessarily tell him exactly who it is. So he began to hesitate and Amir al-Mu'mineen said, look, feel free to tell me. Feel free to tell me and I'll do my best to facilitate. I'll, be my, I'll do my best to help you. He says, look, I'm, I came to this particular city of Mecca because I heard about this name. I, I, I heard about the name Muhammad. I hear that he's claiming to be a prophet and so on and so forth, and I want to visit him. Remember Abu Sufyan. Remember the 950 years of Nuh alayhi salam preaching to his community. And look at Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari. He says, Amir al-Mu'mineen tells him, no problem. You come with me, and I will take you to Muhammad. He has no idea that this is the cousin. He has no idea this is the successor to the holy prophet, and so on and so forth. It is said that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, along with Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari, they enter into the house of the holy prophet. The minute that Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari sees the face of the Prophet, what happens? He says, O Prophet Muhammad, I believe and I submit toward you. That's it, finished. Because his heart was so pure that he was able to see the reality, the true nature of the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people of Nuh, the people who used to live with the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa have absolutely no idea the true nature of these messengers of God. These jinn, they just began to hear a couple of the verses of the whole of the Qur'an and they submitted. What we need to do is reflect during these days, during these nights of the holy month of Ramadan, that we have the whole of the Qur'an in front of us. We recite the whole of the Qur'an every single day within the holy month of Ramadan. We have a thousand copies of the whole of the Qur'an in our houses. We have the whole of the Qur'an in our pockets, on our phones. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the whole of the Qur'an in chapter 59, that if we had revealed the whole Qur'an on top of a mountain, the mountain would have crumbled, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He states in that famous verse, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ جَبَلٍ لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشَأً مُتَصَدَّأً مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ 
that if we had revealed the Qur'an on top of a mountain, we would have seen the mountain humble itself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How come when we recite the whole Qur'an, how come when we reflect upon the book of Allah, how come when we hear the verses, that nothing happens to our hearts? We need to go back and reflect and think that if we were in those same footsteps of the people of Nuh, or if we were passing by hearing the recitation of the Holy Prophet, or if we were present on the day of Ashura, which side would we be on? Are our hearts being humbled toward the words of Qur'an, to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or not? We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to become amongst those who are able to reflect and contemplate and take lessons from the whole Qur'an. My dear brothers and sisters, one of our sisters is very ill in very critical condition. Let us recite five times I of Amma Yujib for her early recovery, inshallah, and that inshallah that she is going to be joining us shortly in the upcoming months. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Amma yujibu al-muthar idha da'ahu wa yakshifu su. Amma yujibu al-muthar idha da'ahu wa yakshifu su. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم وجعلنا وأولادنا من الأنصار وأقوانه وضابين عنه والمستشهدين بين يديه برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين